Welcome back. And as was mentioned earlier in the show, our final segment for today takes a look at Caribbean Integration Week uh, with a specific look at Guyana. And joining us for this conversation, we're joined by the Honorary Council of Guyana in Belize, Hugh South, and Dr. Leroy Almandaras, Director General of Foreign Trade. Good morning and Good morning. welcome. Good morning. Thank you very Good much. Morning. Thank you. So I want to start off by talking about the concept of Caribbean Integration Week. Um, and I'll, I'll ask you, uh, Mr. Stahl, to, to jump in on that. Um, integrate, Caribbean integration speaks to the need for a number of things from different perspectives, uh, historic, cultural, social, and, and the, the hope that out of those experiences would come something that would, a new dawn for the region. And so to my mind, uh, in very simple language, that is how I see Caribbean integration. But, but if, we, if I may jump in here, mm -hmm. because Caribbean Integration Week, there are two weeks that are celebrated in CARICOM. You have CARICOM Week as well, mm -hmm. which will be celebrated later in the year. But CARICOM, Caribbean Integration Week has a lot to do. It's, it's, it's also where the, the University of the West Indies um, get in, gets engaged in a week of activities. Sometimes you have debates because you have to ask the question is, looking at where we have come in terms of integration, the question is, has it, meets its, has it met its objectives? And I think from an analytical point of view, I think that's the kind of discussion that we might want to look at yeah. us here as well. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now it's interesting because when we do talk about uh, Belize and we speak specifically about uh, who we identify with, it is always, no matter of our location, mm -hmm. uh, we would talk about our Caribbean roots mm -hmm. or Caribbean <coughs> identity. Mm -hmm. um, however, oftentimes we are able to say these things, but we don't necessarily tie uh, or make the proper connections. Mm -hmm. um, when you're talking about Caribbean integration and uh, some of the policy levels, which has been a part of the larger conversation now, how do you link the two together, this identity that we align ourselves to, but in, in practice as well? If we, if, I think if we go back, integration started somewhere in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, we have to remember that uh, prior to where we are now, integration did, included British Honduras, not Belize, because we became independent in 1981. As a matter of fact, it was after, I think, after the Second World War in 1947 when the, you know, those heads decided two things we need to do. Mm -hmm. Because remember, they were still under British rule. And so they had to find a way to find unity, but also to, to move away from colonialism. And so in, in, in 1958 was when the first attempt, the first real attempt, was made the, under the West Indian Federation, West Indies Federation. That started in 1958, mm -hmm. and it went from 1958 to 1962, but during that period of time, there were some countries, and the primary countries at that time were Antigua and Barbuda, Guyana, British Guyana, uh, Jamaica, those were some of the countries, and then, of course, Trinidad Trinidad joined. And Trinidad mm -hmm. and Tobago joined. But during that period of time, our, our premier, didn't think that the West Indies Federation was the best thing for Belize and for well, British Honduras. So British Honduras was not a part of it. What derailed that movement, because remember now you're trying to bring small economies together, your small population, because pop the population of the Caribbean or CARICOM without Haiti is about five million people. And so when, when in 1961, when Jamaica decided, Jamaica decided we don't want to be a part of this whole thing because they were looking for independence, they left and Trinidad said, well, one, you know, they decided to move out as well. And so that part failed, the West Indies Federation failed. All right? I don't know if you want to continue. Yes. I think after the failure of the Federation, um, this yearning for um, some type of integration or uh, a oneness of purpose uh, was still there and alive. And so in 1968, you had what is called CARIFTA. That was the, uh, the Caribbean free trade, free trade area. And the bulk of that work was dedicated to trade, to promote trade in the region. And one of the most important uh, protocols 
within um, CARIFTA was the agricultural marketing protocol. And I was telling Dr. Avenares um, earlier that um, I was part of that mm. because I was one of the, um, the marketing uh, specialists at the time whose um, job it was, that was on the um, Demas mm -hmm. at the time was the head of Amina Karif uh, in, in Guyana. Um, they were putting together this protocol for trading in goods. And I remember that, um, so each country, you had to, to set up standards, you know, standards of quality and grading and so on, eh, in order to promote trade. And that is the work that we did, yeah. right? Uh, because at that time, even until now, uh, the main uh, commodity that Belize traded was the red kidney bean. It was. And I remember yeah. at that time, um, your production was just about um, three quarter million pounds. And all of that was taken up by Jamaica because Jamaica was nearer to uh, Belize and the other member states. Mm -hmm. And so although Guyana and um, Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados needed red kidney bean, we felt that, it, you know, that uh, the, it is better to satisfy the, um, the Jamaican market. Yeah. And so that is how Carifta came about. It was a trading, um, uh, it, it was a trading operations dedicated towards promoting production of goods within the, uh, the region and trading in it. Right. What? And then, but then, let me just, just fit something in here because this is where Belize came into the whole um, mm -hmm. integration movement. Although Belize was an observer and existed within the area, this that would have become the economic space. It was in 1971 that Belize became a part of CARIFTA, because CARIFTA lasted, Caricom. well, well, yeah, CARIFTA, yeah, yeah, well, CARICOM, yeah, 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 CARICOM, yeah, CARICOM yeah, but then yeah, it joined yeah. the Federation in 71 yeah. under CARIFTA, mm -hmm. and CARIFTA lasted from 68 to 73. 73 yeah. So again, this move at Federation, this whole move at integration actually failed because, again, remember you're talking about larger economies and small economies and distrust exists because I don't want to, in a sense, create further dependency. I'm trying to survive. You're a small economy. If I integrate with you, I mean, how does that benefit me? Mm -hmm. And so again, because of these, because of not being able to work out the dynamics of integration, that failed in 1973. But it was in 1973 that the Treaty of Chagaramas was mm -hmm. signed. Mm -hmm. And so the Treaty of Chagaramas, that got signed. And this, this, this of course, was not just a case of you know, we just want, again, we, let's try it one more time. You know, let's try this one more time. Because when you think about it, these things are being modeled under other integration blocks, such as the EU. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there must be this understanding that as we are, singularly, we can't do it. All right? So there was, but then a part of, a part of the whole revised Treaty of Chagaramas, there was further integration within the area called the OECS, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States in 1981 under the Treaty of Bastyr. They became, they integrated, this is a small island, St. Kitts and Nevis, Grenada, St. Lucia. They decided, and that's where we hear about EC, the EC dollar, they have their own, Carib you know, their own central bank. That's a form of integration. And mm -hmm. before I forget, it is said now that if Trinidad and Jamaica were to join the OUCS, CARICOM as it stands would be in trouble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The integration movement would be in trouble. Uh, so let me ask a quick <coughs> question. Why continue to struggle for integration when it seems as if though this has been uh, impossible for so long? Well, I don't know well, if you uh, want to use the yeah. word <laughs> impossible. <coughs> well, I, I use that word in the true <coughs> sense sorry. of mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. yeah. is, there, is there a lack of political will? Uh, what's the, the reason why we've not seen integration take root the way it has in the EU, for example, or in other Well, you know, like again, a part of it, because the thing is, in, in that movement went from 73 to 89. In 89, and the, and at Granans, this is where the heads decided. <coughs> the heads decided we need to now form, you know, a common a common market, and a single economy, because it was true that now they started to discuss. As a matter of fact, the person who was um, hired, if you will, to really look at what this new space should be, because with all the challenges and all the failures, was Sir Shridat Ramphal. Mm -hmm. 
And he was a big part of drafting what the CSME is really about. Now, as a matter, but before we do that, we have to remember before, after Carifta, you mm -hmm. had CARICOM mm -hmm. and, the, and the command, I remember you had the command market Com and the market. community. Mm -hmm. So that existed, that failed, but the situation must, the, we must make, make uh, we must uh, uh, mention here as well, there, there were pillars under which it was established, CARICOM. There were three initial pillars. One, <coughs> sorry, economic integration, functional cooperation, and then, uh, and then foreign policy coordination. As a matter of fact, I think you heard recently when the Secretary General said the fourth that was added was security. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So think about that. If you can integrate under those four pillars, it brings a whole lot together because you're talking about resources, you're talking about, remember, after 9-11 in the U.S., yeah. All those security protocols that had to be put in place by Caribbean mm -hmm. nations, all Caribbean nations had to make sure that those things were in place. You see? The most people, when people hear CARICOM, ten, they tend to think it's only CSME. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. CSME is a part of economic yeah. integration. You hear about the Council of Finance and Planning, mm -hmm. you hear about some of the other councils. But then under the, 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 the most successful part of CARICOM at this time is functional cooperation. Mm -hmm. That has to do with education. You have now the University of the West Indies, mm -hmm. which was once University College of the West Indies, which was formed in 1948. It was later, because they only had one campus, Mona, then they went to St. Augustine, you have Kiel now you have the open campuses. Mm -hmm. So education, youth, health, those functional corporations, those areas, you hear about these five C's, the Climate Change Center, mm -hmm. the CRFM, CRFM, those are successes and a functional cooperation in trying to have a harmonized regional policy or foreign policy, that's pretty challenging. Mm -hmm. But it is something that allows us, because you can set up embassies you know, in different parts of the world. You have cases like in, in um, Geneva, where you have the OECS and countries that you can set up. Instead of having a single embassy, yeah. you can actually join forces together. Mm -hmm. So it's think about all those benefits of well. that yeah. can come yeah. out from mm -hmm. integration. Because when we started, we remember that it, we were just colonies. Eh? Mm -hmm. and, and what held us together was the fact that we were all colonies of the British Empire. Mm -hmm. And so, and so and we, 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 the language, eh? the English language was all that we had in common. And once you became in a way had to be found after the failure of the, um, the federation to keep our people together. Because remember, we are small economies. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and if you take the whole of the OECS, you're talking about under 600,000 people. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, so that, and so what they decided to do is to form a block within CARICOM so that the interests of those smaller countries, some of them are just what? 80,000 people. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, you, you, like can take, yeah. you can take you can take some of really? them and drop them into Belize and... Yeah. <laughs> in the chicken bowl. <laughs> <laughs> in the <laughs> chicken <laughs> bowl. <laughs> now, I, and, and I want to I wanna, uh, tap in specifically mm -hmm. in terms of talking about Guyana, because that's part of integration. Mm -hmm. Learning about mm -hmm. the other member states, mm -hmm. um, which unfortunately due to our location is very costly for mm -hmm. Belizeans. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, definitely there isn't as much knowledge about the other member states as those who are, who are closer mm -hmm, in proximity. Mm -hmm. Now, Guyana shares uh, the unique uh, perspective of Belize being mm -hmm. a part of South America, South America and yeah. still a part of CARICOM. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some of the similarities that you see between both countries and whether or not the challenges are similar uh, in terms of what we share in being yes. a part of the all integrated right. Caribbean. I think for, first of all, um, the word Guyana, it, it's an... It's of Amerindian origin, mm -hmm. right? And what it means is land of many waters. Now we, like, Be uh, like Belize, we are the only English-speaking country exactly. in South America. Mm -hmm. While on the other hand, you have Belize being the only English-speaking country in Central America. Uh, the peoples that we have, right? We have mm -hmm. about five, um, five to, to six races of people. We have the Africans. In Ghana, we call ourselves Africans. People like, who look like me, mm -hmm. we call Africans, right? Yeah. So you have Africans, you have East Indians, you have um, Amerindians. Mm -hmm. And the Amerindians will be similar to your, the, the Mayans that okay. you have here. But in Ghana, you have about 20 to 25 tribes. You know, mm -hmm. the Arawaks, the Caribs, the YYs, and so on. Huh? Then you have um, the Portuguese 
for some reason in Guyana, what, what they did is that they divided, they separated mm -hmm. the Portuguese from the other Europeans. And the reason for that was that after slavery, Portuguese were brought to Guyana as slaves, as indentured laborers. But they, 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 they hard work on the sugar plantation. They couldn't survive. And so they brought other people. So, so they, they are distinguished from the other Europeans, like the, the, the British and the, um, the Welsh, the Irish, and so on. And then you have some Chinese, mm -hmm. and then you have the mixed races. So, that, so from that standpoint, there's some similarity. Yeah. Then um, Belize has a fairly large um, land mass and a small population. Same thing with Guyana. Guyana has 83,000 square miles of land, which is about nearly 10 times the size of, of Belize. But then we only have a little over 800,000 people, right? Which is more than twice our population. Yeah. <laughs> about twice your, pop your, pop uh, your population. Um, then um, the things that we produce, right? Um, Guyana is a large rice producer. We produce. Mm -hmm. I think we all. We know produce that now. sugar. That's been established. <laughs> yes. We produce sugar, cattle. There's some parts of Guyana where there's, there's more cattle than people. Like in the whole Rupununi area that uh, next to Brazil, mm -hmm. you have more um, cattle. You have citrus, similar crops as what you have here in Belize. We have coconuts, similar to what you have. But our coconut industry is well established mm -hmm. because it is industrialized. So you, you make um, coconut oil and then refined oils and so on. Eh? Good. Then... then um, the minerals, I think you have small deposits of gold. We do. Guyana has large deposits of gold, gold. Yeah. gold and diamonds and so on. So, so you, you have those type of similarities. And then the, cre the language that you speak, eh? the, the local dialect, the Creole, in, in Guyana, you just call it Guyanese. Eh? And I always remember this joke when, uh, when I came here to, to Belize, my staff, when they used to speak in Creole, mm -hmm. Because they thought that I wouldn't know what's going on, right? <laughs> what they didn't know is that if you're from Burbese in Guyana, mm -hmm. the, Guy the Guyanese from Burbese speak exactly the same Creole as what you speak here. Mm -hmm. And my father was from Burbese. So I used to understand everything, that, but I just kept quiet to, in order to know uh, what's, uh, <laughs> what they really think. What, what, what you write. <laughs> then the other thing is but this. But you know you can't play that trick ever again. <laughs> ever again, no. Just, <laughs> just one sort of thing. <laughs> then um, if you look at the, 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 uh, the land area, mm -hmm. you are one foot below sea level mm -hmm. here. But in Ghana, we are three feet below mm -hmm. sea level. And um, then the land rises as you go inland. In the case of Guyana, you, you leave the coastal plains and then you go to what is called the hilly sand and clay belt. And in that area, you have um, different types of farming that's going on there. Then you have the savannas. And in the savannas, we, we, the new crops that we are trying to introduce there now on very large, like peanuts and um, citrus and so on. And then you have the highland regions. And the highland regions, um, uh, it rises all the way up to about 9,100 feet. Right, and so, so, so it's similar. So there are a lot of similarities, yeah. you know, when you talk people, the food that we eat. Um, Beli in Belize, you eat um, red kidney beans and uh, rice, eh? rice and beans. Yeah. Yeah. In Ghana, we say we eat beans and rice because we, when we cook uh, rice and beans or beans and rice, it's one to one. If you put okay. a pound of beans to a pound of rice, I think here your ratio is a bit different. We eat a lot of black eyed peas. And so a lot of the things we, we buy from uh, Belize, we buy a lot of red kidney beans, a yeah. lot of black eye, black eye peas from, uh, from Belize, and some uh, black beans, and so on. Right? So, so there are a lot of things that, that, that we do have yeah. th that, that we have in common. Yeah. When you talk about the, the integration, why uh, have a week to look at this particular issue? But, you know, it's uh, because it's still something, like I said, it's something, it's something that is still working its way out. And I think as an acad academic exercise, as a matter of fact, you can have some debates for and against. Mm -hmm. There are still those who are questioning whether or not we can do it singularly or we must stay at a part of an integration movement. You go back to prime ministers like Owen Arthur, mm -hmm. who was this real, who was this heavy voice mm -hmm. in CARICOM, for who said, listen, yeah. for integration. Yeah. Ian R. Robinson, who mm -hmm. was, he was one of those who coined the phrase, one from ten leaves zero. zero yeah. And so you have, 
there's still these, one of the biggest challenges right now is economic integration, right? That's one of the biggest challenges. Because, for example, one of the outcomes of the CSME was, is to be the single economy. That was supposed to come on stream last year. But because of the challenges, but you're still trying to work out the, 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 you know, the, the common market. Mm -hmm. or, or, you know, the single, CARICOM single market and economy. Mm -hmm. They're still trying to work out some of those things. Now, those five regimes are working. We have the free movement of people, people goods, services, of course. Um, not just when you say free movement, it doesn't mean just unrestricted and the way you yeah. want to do things. And the EU set up, sets up another, another form of integration that is helping CARICOM, something called the Economic Partnership Agreement. It's an agreement between the countries of the EU, about 28 of them, and countries of CARIFORUM. What, again, they are trying to do, it's another way, another avenue where you can access assistance, financial and otherwise, to help with the whole process of integration. But, as I said, economic integration at this point in time, because you still need a number of harmonized laws, uh, some of the laws that need to be put in place and agreed to. Uh, you still have, for example, you still have um, member states who, who you have, you have member states who are member states are CARICOM, but they're not a part of CSME. For example, Bahamas and Montserrat mm -hmm. are not a part of the CSME. Haiti joined, but Haiti was, in other, in other words, you can hold back in terms of full acceptance, full implementation, because in 2010 they had this large earthquake. So they were very affected. No, remember, that's 10 million people out of the whole of this whole CARICOM space. Yeah. But it does not mean what, has, what needs to happen is that all these countries must understand, yes, we have large economies and we have small economies. We have to find ways of working together, of trusting each other. At one point, somebody recommended this. I, think, I don't know if you remember this. Mm -hmm. It was recommended, rather than having single country sovereignty, form like a board for CARICOM, and just have a group that executes and implements, which would mean that you take your sovereignty and hand it to a group of people. They even yeah. went but that far. But you mentioned <laughs> so trust, and I think that's such an important mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the situation of the CCJ mm -hmm. um, and the number of countries that have come on board oh, with that so yeah, far, yeah. and some of the reasons that mm -hmm. they say they withhold from mm -hmm. moving into that phase. Mm -hmm. And it's important, obviously, mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of uh, <laughs> recognizing yeah. the efforts of integration. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the whole purpose. CCJ, that's why CCJ came aboard. It was to be or final appellate court mm -hmm. so that we could move away from the English system, the Privy Council. But indeed, you only have three, I think, one now built. And you notice, one of the things that consistently has happened since 1971 is the involvement of Belize. Mm -hmm. Belize is very involved. Belize pays its dues. And so in 71, they were there. In 1989, they were there. And out of 1989, remember now, this whole, this thing called this, this revised treaty was then signed in 2001. Mm -hmm. The CSME, they signed on to it in 2006. So Belize is fully, fully, fully involved in the whole process. But we must understand that one of the biggest challenges, and I think you mentioned it, and Hugh, it takes mm -hmm. two days to get to Guyana. Right? Mm -hmm. We know that. Yeah. If yeah. you go, you have to overnight in Miami. Transportation is one of the yeah. big issues that exist. Mm -hmm. So there are certain issues that if they are resolved, will reduce the cost of doing business within the space. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't yeah. mean that you just give up. Because believe me, you leave and you get there. But once you are there, for example, for meetings, etc., those meetings. Another thing that came out that would help with the implementation of CARICOM was the Council of Ambassadors. Mm -hmm. So now you have ambassadors to CARICOM, and those Council of Ambassadors were also to play a role in the implementation. So there are quite a lot of mechanisms that have been put in place. But I think we should also, um, <coughs> why this CSME? Because what the CME, CSME is um, proposing is that the whole of the region will be seen as one market. And so it's like you moving goods from, say, Belize to Toledo. So there'll be free movement yeah. of goods and services, free of establishment. Mm -hmm. so, it's so that if once you are a CARICOM national, be it as a person or a corporate um, identity, you can set up a business in any of the countries and so on. Now, so all of those are. We're, we're getting ready to wrap, but I have one, one question that begs asking. 
at least in my mind's eye. And that's a big part of the challenge has always been that we produce very similar uh, products mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. export. And we we've, we've uh, saw that underscored with the rice mm -hmm, debate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How do we uh, look at when we're talking about trade, especially when there's so many similar things? Mm -hmm. you, you did mention uh, about Belize's red kidney mm -hmm. beans and beans in general mm -hmm. being um, in demand for the region. Mm -hmm. Is that a part of the challenge that we have not diversified our economies to the point where we can, as a block, perhaps provide what what may be lacking? That is a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. That is maybe a it's challenge. a bit deeper. Well, that's quick. Yeah, yeah, maybe it's know. a bit deep, deeper than right. that. Huh? Because mm -hmm. one of the things you have to look at is remember, if I if I produce ten pounds and you produces ten pounds and you two produce, that's forty pounds within a space that we can send to some country outside of the region. Among ourselves, we're, I mean, really, you know, the thing, the situation is what we should have also been looking at is comparative advantage. Mm -hmm. That which I can produce more efficiently mm -hmm. is the product mm -hmm. that I get. And, other, and then I focus on some other country that has comparative advantage in some other commodity. You know, and that creates, a, that because it's free trade. But when you think about it, we would have been meeting all of, we could meet all of our needs by not trying to produce everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, um, what, what should be also stated is this. There are certain strategic plans that are in place in the region that production speaks to. Huh? For example, there's a food and nutrition strategy. And that food and nutrition strategy, the, the basic aim is to ensure that there's enough food, not, not only um, the actual food, but of a nutritious uh, quality that is available to people in the region. That's one. The second thing is this, that what they have done on the, within uh, that strategy was to identify certain countries that would be able to produce certain goods and services that, that would be available in the region. For example, say rice. Huh? Mm -hmm. Now, um, there, there, there was a, a plan that rice would be produced in just a few countries. The countries that have the natural ability to produce rice are Suriname, Guyana and Belize. Belize. And so the, the intention was that you would have what is called, uh, there's a rice net, a rice network. Mm -hmm. And within that rice network, the research on rice would have been done in one place. The distribution of the paddy, the quality standards and so on, would, would be a CARICOM standard. <clears throat> and the movement of the, the CARICOM market would be the, uh, the place where that rice, that first call, the first call would be in the CARICOM market. And, um, and, and it has been working to, to, mm -hmm. to, to a certain extent, right? Because um, the, the research that is, that is done in Ghana is available to Suriname, it's available to Trinidad and Tobago, it's available to Jamaica, because Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago are rice produce, producing countries also, you know. But they do not, but they still are, are importers because, because they're not self-sufficient. The yeah. countries that are self-sufficient are Suriname, Belize, and Guyana, yeah. and with surplus. In the case of Amin, Suriname, and Ghana, we have surplus to export. But you are at um, equilibrium, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, uh, we're out of time with this conversation. <laughs> what else would you like to say in terms of just uh, Caribbean Integration Week and what people should try to uh, inform themselves about? I think here is a, you know, really there's enough research to find out the challenges that we face and why is it that we have, you know, we continue to focus on integration. Yes, there have been challenges. But if properly executed and implemented, the benefits will far exceed, far exceed the costs because it simply means we'll be working together, making, using resources more efficiently. One other thing, if you notice, for CARICOM, you have two Cs. That logo means a whole lot. Logo means unity, and it also means a move away from colonialism. So that symbol, that logo, is not just for the sake of having two pretty C's on a nice background. It's integration, it's unity. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. I w my last words would be this, that um, for integration to have meaning, people have to have benefits, right? there must be benefits from it. And I think that, that, that the youths of the region, they have an opportunity to be entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. to, to, to have new skills. We have not as yet in the region begun to the industrialization of agriculture. We produce rice, but we import rice crispies. Mm. We produce rice, but we import rice flour. 
all of the cookies and the biscuits that we eat in the region. It's the, the flour is a blend of rice flour and um, wheat and flour. So here we're quarreling and talking about uh, a few pounds of rice. When you have millions of pounds of rice available, if you were to industrialize the thing, right? And the same with all of these other, uh, other commodities. The, the movement has to be towards industrialization, where you have the value added. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Pops, this is yeah. what's going to make people. Uh, all right. Uh, well, thank, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. All yeah, right. You're welcome. You. We're going to go ahead and take that final break. And when we come back, we'll have our wrap up. So stay tuned. <laughs>